Hi, I'm Willa Paskin of Dakota Ring, and I'm this week's guest on Metapod. You're listening to Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them, hosted by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. Greetings, everyone. I'm Kevin May, one of your co-hosts on Metapod. And hi, I'm Wendy Morrill, the other half of the hosting equation here on Metapod. Welcome. Now, Wendy, in the spirit of our guest this week, I thought we'd do party at the front and business at the back. <laughs> oh, really? Wait, business at the back? <laughs> I, I guess you were rather taken with that saying when we talked to Willa, weren't you? Even though there are many great ways to refer to a mullet in casual conversation, Kev. Indeed I was, although now I'm slightly embarrassed that business at the front, party at the back had not entered my vernacular prior to now. Well, it's not too late to make up for lost time, Kev. Uh, please go ahead and uh, make use of it as often as you like on our Metapod introductions from here on in. You're too kind, too kind as always. Right, anyway, let's talk about Willa Paskin. She's the host of the extremely popular culture and history podcast called Decoder Ring. She is. It's a superb podcast exploring the roots of everything from the Karen and Simpson to Jane Fonda's workout and why Judy Garland is so popular in the gay community. Seriously, Cracking Cultural Mysteries is about as perfect a description for Decoder Ring as you can get. So stand by as we discuss all of that and more with our guest this week, Willa Paskin. Kev, you may start the tape. Hi, Willa, and welcome to Metapod. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You are the presenter of Decoder Ring, which is a Slate podcast, and Kevin and I are big fans of it. Thank you. We're glad you're here on Metapod, and I thought we could start off by asking you about the name Decoder Ring. Oh, sure. There's not a good, <laughs> there's not a good story for this. We basically knew what the show was going to be, and we were trying to come up with a name, and it was a struggle. Ben Frisch, who's the producer, and I sort of like both liked Curio at the beginning, but the editor Slate was like, eh, really not into it. Um, okay. Thought it just like made it seem trivial. I think we talked about some other things. Was some we were trying like push pins and string, you know, like those walls of crazy they have, and like, mm -hmm. um, like, but it was just seemed like I don't know if that would was evocative. So then we landed on Decoder Ring, which like the, the sort of the show has this kind of kitsch aesthetic and like theme song that it's not. I'm not Ben is into that stuff. I'm not sure like. I would have just landed there, but I also didn't have a better, okay. have a better thought. <laughs> so that's what it's called now. Yeah. So, so is the name um, really connected to the the theme and the mood that I certainly feel in the music that's been chosen throughout? The well, podcast? certainly the theme song is very connected to this sort of like, and mm -hmm. and also, I mean, what also happened is some of it's sort of coincidental to what our first episode was our first episode ever was just about like what happened to the laugh track mm -hmm. which is obviously sort of very connected to like these 50s and 60s sort of motifs which is what the theme song sounds like um and that was not like that was we did that backwards in the sense of like we matched that to that episode and then it, i don't think when we created it when we were like oh definitely that's what's gonna be the theme okay. song forever but then it was sort of like, oh, I guess this will work. And now it sort of is. I mean, yeah, you know, it's it's definitely like a mood. But um, we decided we would use it very quickly. But um, I think if the first episode had been thematically different, it might have sounded different. I, yeah, I was curious because I think some of your episodes really start to take off at the point in the story, which is maybe post-war and the sort of realization in American culture that children and teenagers are a new market to make money from. I mean, so, the craziest it, thing about the show is like, I had no idea I was doing a history show, which I <laughs> obviously am. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like, that was not, that was like, not at all. I didn't even realize it was I was doing until like halfway through, you know, like many, many episodes. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not, I mean, that's just, it's almost like if you're trying to answer why or where something comes from, like inevitably you have to go into the history. And so that's where it turns into a history show. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just so obvious. It's like so much that, that it seems like I must have known <laughs> that's what we were doing. And it, it really started more like, I want to do a show about like cultural mysteries and questions. And and then it just turns out that they have this big historical piece now. Um, and to the point that obviously some, and some of them are fully historical mysteries. Like there's things that happened in the past. Um, 
but a lot of certainly at the beginning and still like a lot of them come out of something that's happening now and then it just turns out all the explaining like the Karen or something like that um, right yeah there are these episodes that start now and then there are others that or maybe bygone phenomena. Or right, subjects. like Bart Simpson or like the Cabbage Patch Kids or, um, mm. yeah, like th- or Byron, like things that literally happened in the past. The execution, um, I mean, I think you have a certain style and what is that style? Can you describe well, it? Or? You know, I have this background where I'm a TV critic or I was a critic. And so I think that the shows are making arguments about ideas having to do with the topics that maybe is not totally common in this kind of thing or there's like we try to have a lot of ideas in with like all the information and and I mean this is the way that all historical or all like presenting you information works is like it is actually making an argument sometimes you just can't tell because it just seems like well that's what the information is you know like you don't realize like the narrator has packaged it for you kind of um and that's what we're doing right so I think that there's a I think that kind of because of my background doing that that's sort of there's maybe like a little more of that than there might be um in a show that was just like we're gonna tell you what happened I mean they those shows would also do that too but I just don't know it would be quite so knowing I think it'd be interesting to get into some of the actual subjects that you've covered yeah yeah so, uh, I've listened to maybe about seven or eight yeah in preparation for this you know, I don't like flattering people particularly, but I do think it's one of the I best. I hate being I, flattered, so don't. Well, I'll definitely, <laughs> I'll definitely say it then, and we'll do flashing lights. Great, great, great. We can both be uncomfortable. You know, I, I will <laughs> say it, I think it's one of the best kind of cultural uh, history stroke type of that genre ones that I've listened to, just because way the way you present it too, because the topics are just terrific. You know, as a Brit. <laughs> um, the subject of the Karen one. Let's go straight in with the Karen one. I just thought yeah. it was fascinating because it's not a name that we are recognizing yet. Unfortunately, yeah. or fortunately, depending on your point of view, we have imported a lot of cultural things from the US over the years, but we haven't quite got to the Karen. And I wondered, just listening to that, and if you can give us your kind of perspective on it a little bit, it's a really new one. Yeah, that... it is a new one. It is a new one. The just... name has changed. The identity of that kind of person goes back decades, but the name that's been yes. given to them has changed until quite recently. Right. Is so... there a danger that you're kind of focusing on something that's very near and might be out of date by the time we get to the end of this year or does that not bother you that doesn't bother there's so i'm going to say like four things now the first is it not directly related which is we have people that aren't american that listen and it's really interesting because i think there's things that really resonate and then there's things that there's their own national like information that would be interesting to explore yeah. about it like when we did this ice cream trucks one england has a the UK and Margaret Thatcher has this whole thing with like Mr. Softy that like we just didn't like include but would have been obviously germane and then the mullet one you know there's definitely like an Australian history with the mullet that like it just very and then there's occasionally someone will send me like a delicious mystery that I don't nothing about but because it's like it's like very it's in other countries and I don't have enough like context to even start but I'm like someone should do this I just I can't do it so that, that is interesting I'm doing one about water right now and uh, about hydration and like Dasani tanked in the UK and like that's really interesting because it's still you know, it'll just play differently because, you know, so that's, that's its own thing. Um, For something like the Karen, no, you know, I, the thing about a podcast is, right, like it comes out, it has like a time and then it sits in our feed and sort of it's amazing because people come back and actually like when they find the show, then they have like 30 episodes they can listen to. And that's really great. And I'm not actually like, I think, I think because the Karen one has so much history in it and because in America, certainly the Karen's not really going anywhere. I feel like it's, I'm not, that one seems like it's going to, I'm not, I'm not concerned about it not being germane. It, it was different in the sense that it was like timely in a way that a lot of our topics are sort of like evergreen or maybe they have, maybe they're in, like we did one about Baby Shark. It's not like the song Baby Shark. Like song Baby Shark was like, it was of the moment-ish, you know, <laughs> it certainly was yeah. more of the moment then than it will be in two years, but it wasn't quite as like on the cusp. But you know, the virtue of doing something that is like timely is that, I think the Karens are most listened to episode, you know? Um, I think people, it was like timely and people were very, like wanted to understand what was going on um, with that word and its history. And like, and so that, that seemed like, I think was something we should do more of basically if we could, you know, if we were sort of in, which right now, for example, like we're not quite in a position to be that spry. Um, and I wish we could be more spry sometimes. Yeah, I was trying to um, put a British context to it. And the only names that I could think of, which doesn't quite match, 
is the name Sharon, yeah. uh, which was a name in the 80s that was given to um, or Essex girls, as they were called here. Um, slightly white trashy, I think would be the term that perhaps you might use. And But they didn't have that kind of an, uh, slightly edgy racist part to it. So it would be unfair to kind of compare yeah. both Sharon. The other, the other one, the only other one that I could think of, and this is the one that one my wife pointed out, was the name Kevin itself, which was a, annoyingly a figure of ridicule in the 80s, which I'm still suffering the scars, <laughs> the scars from, from now. But it, it is interesting that that one, that particular name has taken off so much I mean what kind of feedback did you get as a result of that episode it was like good I mean we we were obviously um very careful with that episode I don't mean like we were more thoughtful that right. like anything that you do on the internet now potentially you could do wrong and someone yeah. would be upset with you about it or a lot of people and it just was very clear in doing an episode about the Karen the chances of that happening were higher say than doing it about the mullet um and so we were you know we had more people listen to it and were more thoughtful about that but I was but I was so I was I was sort of expecting it to make you know, to maybe go pear shaped, you know, in the way, but it was, it seems like people were, it seemed it went over. It was good. I mean, I think we did. I mean, we took it really seriously. I think we did a good job, but we didn't, it was not, um, it was surprisingly, it wasn't really any more feedback than about anything else that we get, but people really listened to it because they were interested. And that it's, was... it's, it's, I'm curious. I'm, I'm a journalist myself and we go through this every day. You wonder how it's going to go down. I, I don't want to labor the point. I'm curious as to why you were worried about it, given the. Well, it's it, just it, like it I'm a white person and... talking about like it's about race, you know, so right. it's like I mean, in the sense that the Karen is a white woman, it's like very like um, there's topics it feels like it's not my place as a white person to like be an authority on or make myself an authority on or center myself. But it's like the Karen sort of actually. And we thought about that a lot. Um, but the Karen being a white woman actually ends up being sort of um, an okay, it sort of was like an okay thing to explicate, you know, in that right. way. Yeah. And we were like very sure to, almost everyone in that episode who isn't me is a person of color, which we were really thoughtful about um, wanting to do, mm -hmm. except for the lead person who is a white woman named Karen. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, I mean, we just, I think it was a really, it was, it was a really interesting topic. And it, like a lot of the times when I go into a subject, I have a idea about it. And I need that. I, I want that idea to be like a rich, juicy idea. But then usually there's other ideas or that doesn't turn out to be an idea. But there sort of has to be that one. And I was very early on, like before we did it, I was I was really thinking about this idea of like, which comes up in the end of the episode, this idea about sort of the name Shaniqua or Shanene, like sort of where this his history in America, certainly of like uh, really horrible racist behavior directed at women and black men with quote, black names, which is all these studies of like, incredible institutional racism based on quote black names and I was just like how you know people are upset about Karens but like this is nothing like people who are named Karen are upset but like there's you know decades and decades of like horrific racism directed at people who have quote black names and I, I just like that reverse seemed to me like I was like there's an episode here and then there turned out to be so much more than that you know funnily enough it was the first episode I listened to yeah I, I think a lot thought, of people I, got to the I just thought that way, wow this is really terrific and then I went to the Bart Simpson one which you couldn't <laughs> get more kind of... uh, you could get more different because the Bart Simpson one weirdly is also about politics that would like just like that ends at like the R and like the Republican National Convention in a funny like not all our episodes have anything to do with anything serious and Bart Simpson yeah. weirdly also did but is different on it what sort of requests do you receive from your audience very hard and in a way that is not helpful and like <laughs> we should be it should be easier to be like this is what an episode is give us your ideas so sometimes we get great ideas and they're like just you know gender reveal for example like I think we had talked about it we got a bunch of emails being like explain that to me and we were like yeah we should do that and that one was hard too in the sense that that's also about something pretty dark and serious, even though you can sort of, it seems sort of funny. Um, uh, and we got a lot, like the mullet ones, that was like the best pitch we got because someone pitched it to us with like this incredible backstory. And we're like, that's an episode. And then we found more was we were searching through it, but that like the pitch almost came to us with the whole story, which is really incredible. But I think the thing is that's hard to understand for everybody who just listens to the show and almost for us is it's like, there's almost two kinds of episodes. There's ones where um, it starts with a question like, I'm curious about decorative pillows or I'm curious about water bottles or like, 
you know, and some of those are really questioned. Why are there so many decorative pillows on people's beds? You know, whatever. Or like, I see someone's good tweet. Like what did happen to Byron when he got canceled? Or like, it is crazy that Bart Simpson was like a controversial figure. Like he seemed, you know, um, and then we like excavate and make and find the narrative of the history. But there's mm-hmm. also a version where it's just like a good story. Um, and those I think can be really awesome to listen to and are necessary sort of to it working. And that is a thing that I, I think people pitch us almost always like topic and some, you know, you can't, it has to have like the topic can have the topic itself can be the arc, but it does have to have a story arc. So it's like, really, I would, I wish we did more just like almost like just features, you know, like a, it has like a protagonist and like it has a story and we like sort of tricked it out with additional information, but those are hard to find. And I mean, like a sort of like maybe the platonic ideal of like the mix of those two is probably the Chuck E. Cheese episode because Ben, the producer, it starts with this guy, Jared, who um, is probably in his, my age, I think he's in his, so he's just about to be 40 or his late thirties. And he, as a kid became obsessed with a Chuck E. Cheese puppet called the King. And he now still has like rescued all these, you know, um, decommissioned animatronic ancient technology puppets and has a band with them. And he the, had sort of the been big profiled. ones. Yeah, they're really big. They're like tall. Yeah. yeah. They're like eight feet tall, 10 feet tall. Well, his is called the King. It was an Elvis lion. They look cool. You should anyway. And um, I did and ben had a, a pizza listening. party at Papa Gino's once and they had <laughs> that they had those two, but they weren't as good as the one. Is it? <laughs> Jeez. Totally. Anyway, so, I am 10 years older. So. <laughs> I had never been to a Chuck E. Cheese before I did this episode ever because I'm from <laughs> New York City. We didn't really like have Chuck E. Cheese. I think it's right. more of a suburban thing. But Ben, who listens to this other, had heard this thing about animatronics, had gotten sort of interested, had found this guy, Jared. And so we were starting to do that. And then I was like, oh, there's this whole like pizza war, which is famous, like the Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza in America, like these two animatronic pizza party chains, like duked it out in the 80s. So then I was like, I got the guy, like I approached all the sort of like this guy, Aaron Fector, who sort of has created these animatronics for Showbiz Pizza, this guy, Nolan Bushnell, who sort of also created Atari and created Chuck E. Cheese. So like, it was basically like, so we, so Ben had found sort of like this character and then we found, then I was like, oh, there's all this history and we found these other characters. And so it sort of like had both things. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that that episode is sort of so satisfying. It's like a crazy story, but there's all this human element. Um, and yeah, and so those things are like both key and they don't always both happen. <laughs> but like that, you know, I wish people like pitched us just like, I have a crazy story. But What's it, the like, weirdest request you've had to be decoded? Oh, I, I couldn't remember. Like people, people have really good ideas, you know, it just sometimes there's not, I was like, the problem is like people have really good ideas and you get it. And sometimes you just, you start to push on it. I don't know how to, it's almost like, it's like literally like if you, you get a topic and you start to look at it and you're like, oh, this is going to like, there's like, it's hollow under here. If I push, it's going to pop up like a spring door and there's going to be a whole like mm-hmm. passageway. And then a lot of times you start to push and it doesn't feel that way. Right. Like, it's like, oh, this is like too straightforward or something. Like someone had, someone had, when registered around the election, someone was like a number of people were like, can you explain the red blue thing? Like, when did we in America become so obsessed with this idea about red blue states? And it's a good question, except it has a very straightforward answer, which is basically it's the 2000 election when Gore v. Bush. So like everyone was literally watching red versus blue for like 10, you know, for months because they were, as they were trying to figure out the stuff in Florida. So it was like, that's a really good question, but it's too simple. There isn't, there's no push. Anything too taboo that you wouldn't consider? No, there's things that I have turned, that we've started to do that we haven't done because I found them to be sort of like dark. And I think we could probably stand to do sort of more serious and more like plaintive things sometimes, but dark, it's just not like we had sort of, we had sort of been investigating doing something about like Woodstock 2, which is the one where it sort of turned into this like horrible fiasco and there was a ton of like rape and sexual harassment and it was really awful. And also sort of had been looking into like Winona Ryder, the shoplifting scandal. And both of those things sort of seemed like they might be right for us. And then they just seemed pretty sad. And Do you think time will change that? With those two, I don't know that they will, you know? I mean- um, are there topics where you think, well, this needs to wait for a little bit or? No, I mean, we have topics where like, we have to wait because it seems like the person will participate maybe eventually. And uh, okay. that would be good. But it hasn't, I haven't had a topic where I'm like, oh, we could get to this in six months or in two years because it's too um, fraught now. It just seemed like, like I think of the show as sort of, even when it's about something serious, like pretty entertaining. And mm-hmm. there's a kind of like ickiness, like a, just a 
horrible human like the, it's you know the thing about the gender reveal party and karen is like it gets into horrible human stuff you know but there's <laughs> thing about specific ickiness it's just like it i don't know how to it just seemed not quite right in also, general, maybe it was just like the fake maybe it's just a fake out of like with the karen and even the gender reveal you kind of know there's ickiness there like that's part of what's interesting about it certainly the karen like the ickiness is on its face but with something like Woodstock or Winona Ryder, you're like, oh, this is going to be fun. And then you're like, it's not going to be fun. And it's not going to, there's not going to be fun at the end. Like there's no, like, it's not going to be fun story. And you think maybe it's going to be. And so it doesn't, it's not going to work for us, you know? So you think people generally like to listen to that human ickiness that's more entertaining than dark? I think people, you know, there's tons of podcasts that are really serious and there's tons of podcasts that are plaintive and thoughtful and that do a lot of different things. I think my default is to sort of not be that, like to be serious about not serious things, um, which may be a flaw. Like maybe I should just be like, maybe that's, I don't know what, maybe that's, some, you know, who knows what that's about. But, um, <laughs> but that also like sort of now we have the show and kind of what you, you know, you don't, it's like, I feel like we could make people cry in a like, where you're like, that was heartfelt away. But I don't want to like make people disturbed. Like that's really, like they kind of know what they're coming for and that mm -hmm. maybe isn't it, you know? So here's a fine line there in that. You don't want to make people feel disturbed. And uh, we can talk about that in a second. But my question was that I was thinking about is after the clown episode, yeah which again i thought was terrific me and my wife and my two kids spent their following dinner talking about the episode and the origin of the clown because my son thinks the idea of it is wonderful my daughter <laughs> thinks it's terrifying and we were saying oh, i've just listened to this terrific episode of this podcast and talked to them through what you know started off as like a court jester and all that kind of stuff and where it is now and i the reason i'm asking this is that what do you consider to be a successful episode other than what Slate wants in terms of downloads and all those kind of things. Is it the fact that it potentially ignites a dinner table conversation? I, I should also say, like, I am happy to disturb people, just like in a certain way. Do you know what I <laughs> right. mean? So like, I want you to be along for the ride. So like, definitely like, I, I can, I would be happy to like make you question your priors about anything, but I don't want you, yeah, I just think it's not a show where you're supposed to be like, uh, you know, like really, deeply icked out like yeah. and that's not to say there's icky I, I think there's a way to approach really like icky subjects that aren't that so yeah. i'm not saying like i'm happy i want the show to it maybe make you think yeah that, the, the, the point about the clown thing is it wasn't icky but it was still disturbing <laughs> it's, it's an interesting balance that's what i mean right um you know i think what do i think about the episode no i just like i want to think they're good and that like and to be proud of them you know, and I think almost all of them, I basically am. I mean, I don't know that they're all as successful as like they could be. And I certainly, when I listen back to a lot of them, I'm like, oof, I'm talking too much or like, oof, I would cut out a bunch of this stuff or like, oof, I was really in my own head. And like, I thought that this needed like an, a paragraph of explanation here and ooh, it didn't. And like, you know, I think we've sort of, I think there's less, I think we sort of eased up on like showing my thinking as it's gone on a little bit in a way that's helpful. But no, like okay. I'm, so on I'm that, also... sorry, sorry, Willow, on that point then, would you say then that there's been more editorializing in the earlier episodes and now you're a little bit more kind of um, just telling it how it is? No, I don't know. I would have to listen. You know, it's been a long time since I've listened to some of them. And I actually think like the laugh track one is pretty good in terms of yeah. like actually having a lot of like, in a way that also is because we had more time, it actually has like a, the, the structure, like the idea structure of that episode is like pretty aspirational to me for future ones. Like there's like a long enough time and iteration to do it, to be like, oh, this is, these are like the actual ideas I'm talking about. And I can set them up properly where like, I think if you, if I had more time with some of the later ones, maybe that would have emerged and then I could have, but it actually just takes a lot of work because it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't clear to me like from the start that that was like the structure that episode should have, for example. I mean, there probably should be less even still. Like, I think a lot of it is like, I think some of it is self-evident, you know, and I can just like ease up a bit. Some of it's not, you know, I, I don't think, like, I think the way that I am thinking about things is important to like the DNA of the show, but that doesn't have, you don't have to go so far, right? Like a lot of it, I just think a lot of it is like a lot of how I'm thinking about something is literally in like, is it, is, is clear to me now is literally in how I'm sort of presenting information, which won't, wouldn't, would be less clear to the listener, right? Because the listener would just be like, this yeah. is just the order of things. And this is just what it means. But actually a lot of that is work, but it's not me talking. Right. And you said, um, just before that other question, you were saying, you listen back and you go, oof, I could have done this. And oof, I could have done that. <laughs> what were some of the, the oof moments then? That well, you I just had gone back. I had just gone back and listened to the sad Jen one. I don't remember why. Why was I doing that? 
because we were working on something else that was related. Let me just, I was working on something that I was like, I think the structure of the sad Jen is episode. So the, I did do this episode about Jennifer Addison. That's actually really an episode about tabloid culture in America and the rise of Us Weekly um, and its relationship to Jennifer Addison. And I listened back to it because we were doing an episode about something that I thought the structure was similar. And when I listened back to it, I just was like, oh, there's a very good episode in here. And I wish I could have another pass of it, you know, um, just like too much of me talking a lot of like things. It's like where I'm like, you know, like obviously or like to lay my cards on when it's like just very clear that I don't need to say that or the reader, the, the listener would they could just it's like a, it's not a real thing. Yeah. Should have, it could have been slicker. <laughs> so most of your episodes feature some experts on your subjects. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of, um, well, a lot of divergent opinions. Like there's no heated debate or not in the episodes I've listened to anyway. Is that a choice that, or maybe it's happening in all the interviews that you're no. giving and they just I don't mean, get included or well i think the truth is that so i'm coming to this as like almost all these topics i don't know anything about them right mm -hmm. so insofar as i would argue with an academic about their field of study <laughs> you have to be like pretty deep into the thing to be like this nit you know what i mean so i'm just like not i'm often not like deep enough to be like I know this is a contentious point. And also like, I don't know that it, I think in most instances it's not necessarily like germane. It's like a little inside baseball. I mean, the, perhaps like the most, it's like, I'm not, I never fight with people when I'm talking to them. I mean, sometimes you do push back a little bit, you know, in the hotel, we did this episode about hotel art and we did have an art historian who hates hotel art. And we gave him a lot of chance to talk about how much he hates hotel art. And that, so we used him that way. Cause like, I just felt like that was a thing where it's like, people really do have strong feelings about hotel art and whether or not it's art and I don't um you know and like with something like the gender reveal episode for example like we definitely could have found more people who really love a gender reveal party but then it becomes am I gonna I don't love a gender reveal party so then I'm having this person on not like I'm not I'm not both sides of it so like then I'm just gonna okay, crap yeah. on them so that feels like a little it's like if I'm gonna like anyone that I speak to I want to like I want them to listen to it and be like I was represented accurately mm -hmm. and that person didn't trick me so you know like we just I'm just doing this episode which I don't want to get into too much because it's not coming out until June but about hydration for example and it's about the rise of a bunch of things but there's a segment that's about sort of the rise of bottled water and I in the reporting I was oh I would love to speak to some people who were at like Nestle and Dasani and Aquafina in the 90s and I approached a couple people and they were going to talk to me and then they backed out and I realized I was happy about that because I actually think the rise of bottled water is like a pretty nefarious force in like the world. And if I had spoken to them, I, it, it's almost like I don't know what would have happened because they would have told me some version of their story that I would have been empathetic to and sympathetic to and then presented it that way. Probably, I mean, I think while still being critical of bottled water, but now I just got to be super critical of bottled water because I hadn't talked to anybody who I was like selling out by being like, not selling out, but just like being, feeling like I've been dis like lied to, misrepresented to them the argument about the episode. You know, it's like now I can just say what I want about bottled water because I don't have anyone who's like life's work was making bottled water. How um, much opinion or interpretation do you include from regular people? I mean, like your family you or friends. Um, in an episode, do you consult regular people who aren't necessarily expert yeah. on a topic? Uh, not, no. I think like this is when I said I do a lot of, and I over interview. I end up having like a lot of conversations with people who are mm -hmm. sort of expert, but are not, but are expert maybe in the way that I am. So like a lot of other, you know, I did a piece about movies and I talked to too many critics and then I ended up like sort of only using the cinematographers kind of, you know, or the historians, because it's actually like the critics can sort of do what I do. And it was helpful to think about it from all these different angles, but it wasn't actually helpful mm -hmm. progressing the story. But then, yeah, also like, of course, like we talk, you know, I talk to my family. I talk to Ben talks to his friends. Like we talk to people we work with. So, you know, and also like all the episodes, I don't, I mean, it's almost like a cliche, but almost all of them open with a regular person at this point who like has some connection to this topic. Like the, the cold opens tend to be like random woman or man. I think my favorite regular what person is yeah. the guy who you ask to slip into his clown persona. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> I'd like to I talk to whatever his name is. That's and there's this just giant God, clearing of his of his body of his throat. <laughs> yeah, I loved that guy so much. I mean, that also happens sometimes when you're just like talking to people and it just turns so fun, you know? You're just like, <laughs> this is great. Like, I love you. And like that just like, you know, you're having something to talk about and it's, so, it's really just he was he was really delightful that guy <laughs> it was a long time ago but yeah um you mentioned in a, an answer just a moment ago about differences of opinion uh, that wendy asked 
And I'm curious, have you started out on the journey for a particular episode with your premise, maybe not the question, and the narrative has had to change because of the answers that you've got back from your experts? Well, I would say, I'll, I'll look, I'm going to look at my actual, all the episodes, but I would say one of the things about the show is it's very, like, I don't know what it's going to be. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I really do start, like I start with a topic and it it is exploratory genuinely. I don't think I know what the episode is until I've talked to all those people. So yeah. in that way, it's not, it doesn't feel like changing my mind. I literally don't know what it's going to be until I've done it. You know, it's not like, I mean, a sort of maybe sometimes towards the end, it's like, oh, I need this person to plug in here to say this thing. I mean, that almost never, ever happens. It's, it's almost always, I spoke to all these people and then I took from that information what they said like this is the episode so um so right so it doesn't feel like it doesn't so the answer is basically it doesn't it hasn't happened very often because it's like it's not the one comes after the other not the other way around but yeah almost every time I do an episode I end up more interested and sympathetic to everyone involved than I thought I was gonna be maybe oh you know this is like sorry just if something so like the Jane Fonda episodes is like a perfect example of like I had been interested in Jane Fonda I had been interested in the Jane Fonda workout we decided to do an episode about it the idea that I was thought that was enough, like, as I said, I usually have to have, like, I usually want to have, like, one sort of big idea, which maybe ends up being a small idea or something, which was like, oh, it turns out that Jane Fonda, the whole history of Jane Fonda is, like, she was villainized because of her stance on Vietnam and actually what she was but it turns out basically she's really villainized because of how that was like recontextualized in the 980s and in the 80s of the Reagan era Americans misremember how we hated Jane Fonda and you can actually see that because she was hugely famous in the beginning of the 80s because of the Jane Fonda workout right so it's like how was it was like how is Viet uh, how is like Hanoi Jane in everyone's living room like something about that doesn't make sense so I started reporting that episode and we got to speak with Jane Fonda who was totally interested in this other thing having to do with this woman Lenny Kasdan who had sort of created the workout with her. And I had actually approached Lenny because I had about speaking with her just sort of in the way of like, I'm going to do a history of the Jane Fonda workout. I obviously want to talk to everyone who made it. So then we got on the phone with both of them and then just turned out to have all this like water under their bridge and saw this stuff. And so I was, we did the interview and I was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And I was literally trying to make it one episode. And I was like, this isn't going to fit in one episode. I think mm -hmm. this is two episodes. Yeah. Like, but it was a really close thing. It might, I almost could have been like, I'm just going to shove it all. Like, and that's like, I just didn't know it was there. So like that does happen. Happen. Mm -hmm. But that's not like, that's me changing. I mean, just like, it's not even changing my mind. It's like, I literally didn't know what I had until I talked to them. And I never would have if I had, if that interview hadn't happened, you know? And I would have done an episode about the Jane Fonda workout, which would have been the second episode of that. It, it, again, good episode. So uh, <laughs> as we kind of get to the to, to the end, it might be the same answer for the both of these questions, really. But I came into Decoder Ring, as I said earlier, listening to the Karen story. Yeah. If you were to recommend to our listeners that haven't listened, which should be their debut episode, which one should it be? I think the Karen is really good. I think yeah. the Jane Fonda okay. workout part one is like, uh, is maybe my, my favorite. I really like that one. Um, yeah, that was my next, that was my next question is, do you have a personal favorite? Yeah, that, that is my current things. personal favorite. I think the mystery <laughs> of the mullet one is, is really fun. Um, yeah. People really like the Chuck E. Cheese one. Oh, you know, another one that I listened to that I was like, this is all here, but oof, I wish I had another pass of this is truck nuts. That one has like tons, like it's all there. It just like needed, I can make that thing sing now. It's, but I mean, it's still interesting, but like I, I could really make that one a lot better. Okay. The John Locke, both the first two episodes are like, they're, I think they're about really interesting things, <laughs> um, which is one is about the laugh track. And um, I think we did a good job with it. And one is just about fandom conspiracy called the John Locke conspiracy, which yep. remains in, it's like more relevant every day um, because as every internet community just starts to behave like um, as fan communities, I mean, they're all our fan communities maybe. Um, so that one I think is really good too. Are there any episodes where you continue or update? I mean, in the Laugh Track episode, I really like this point where you, you start to discuss social media and how that's a conversation happening in another place about maybe a TV or program mm -hmm. that you're watching. Yet it doesn't, it doesn't go too far, really. It's sort of a comment you make. Would you continue a piece that sort of comes out of an episode into another episode or an, an update? Yes. Appendix. Um, totally. <laughs> I think there's like a version of the show or like a version of like a, like a mini, a mini arc where we almost do that intentionally, like mm -hmm. where we would be like, this is the big story. And then like pull four episodes out of it, like by just sort of like- okay almost like rabbit holing or like we did this one about um unicorn poop it's called unicorn poop. it's really about about how poop got cute in kids toys um which is 
it's it's actually like it's really a trend and it's very it's interesting to me I have two small kids and that one like it it like sort of is talks about like how toy cult it gets into sort of how toys are designed and made now and that like touched on like unboxing videos it touched on like a bunch of like incredible YouTube trends that all could have been episodes themselves I don't mm -hmm. know that the virtue of like having done this one I'm not sure what the virtues of doing those necessarily would have been the only episode we've done that I'm like, oh, we should do this again because we didn't get the story is the Cabbage Patch Kids one, which is that sort of soon after, like we didn't talk to the main guy and we're never, who sort of invented them and we're not going to be able to speak with him, I don't think. But there had been someone who was sort of in charge of originally licensing them who I had approached a couple of times, but his wife had died recently and he sort of didn't get the emails. And I spoke with him after is the only one where I felt like we hadn't properly flooded the zone on reporting. And so there was actually stuff that was like missing in the version of the story. And I would hope to do a follow up or like an you know either a second episode or like mm -hmm. an extra 10 minutes um about that yeah it's interesting i was listening to the the simpsons episode yeah and was getting through it and getting through it and as we were getting towards the end i was wondering i wonder if this was made before the arpu <laughs> kind of scandal blew up and then you mentioned it at the end I was like, oh, okay one of my questions is not going to be do you have to do updates because that's when you did you did do that. <laughs> it was just interesting that was a huge thing here in the UK when yeah when they released the statement about what they were going to do it was a big thing here too no yeah I mean I think I could imagine us having to do updates but you know a lot of them it's like this is the thing I mean they're not most of them are not so new or like unfolding you know so um you know what i mean yep. kevin did you have cabbage patch kids in the uk in the 80s it, i i remember the cards they oh, did was, uh, <laughs> did they <laughs> I yeah. remember the cards more than I remember the yeah. figurines. But or you weren't, those were the garbage pail kids. No, they were. They were the garbage pail kids. No, the cabbage patch kids were in the UK, but they were not quite as big a deal. <laughs> no. Um, but like, there's all these stories about like people who were like upset, like flying to UK to buy them for their kids because they couldn't get them in America. <laughs> but yeah, like that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the cabbage, like we probably have hit the limit of like 80s nostalgia items we can do for like a while. <laughs> You know, like people ask us to do Beanie Baby ones a lot. And that like seems, I, I could see us doing Beanie Babies, but it's too, it seems like you can see it too much. Like what I want is for you to be like, that totally makes sense as an episode, but I wouldn't have predicted it. This is not something you've done before. And that's what's also hard about what people pitch is like an episode goes up and people pitch things that are like it. So like Cabbage Fetch Kids goes up and people are like Beanie Babies or a bunch of like 80s toy fads. And like, and some of those are good, but we just did it, you know? So one of the episodes we haven't done because I couldn't figure out how to do it. And it sort of speaks to like the question you were asking, differing viewpoint is about astrology, which I don't personally have much truck with and I, I'm not, you know, into it. <laughs> Um, and, and so I did a bunch of interviews about that. And I think there was a way to do the piece. It was, it would have been these two parallel stories, someone who became disillusioned and someone who got into it in a way that was sort of interesting, but like, right. It was just like, can I do this and not just be like, and not be scoldy, not tip my hand. I think it's bullshit. Like, mm -hmm. should I be doing yeah. it? You know, it's just like, it's not like people don't know, like people have made up their mind about whether or not they think it's bullshit. It's also sort of not, it's sort of like, what's interesting to me about it is like, why? And that maybe also isn't that interesting. There's lots of explanations for why that are sort of all like fuzzy, but feel right, you know, about uncertainty and stuff. Sometimes it'd be hard to actually hide your own perspective. Well, we're doing this one about hydration where I haven't hit my own perspective <laughs> and it comes that. close to like, a lot of the stuff, the stuff that's like sort of new agey spirituality adjacent things where people really are really into it and know that there's a lot of criticism of it. It's like, it's, just, it's a hard, it's hard to get it. It's hard to find, figure out what the tone is or like what's the, you, you know, or you're just like preaching to the choir. Like, what are you trying to do? What, what can you bring? And so the astrology one is, I'm not saying we'll never do it, but it was a little bit of a pickle. I think probably if we had gotten into the right time, we could have like gotten into it like th through like why Mercury and retrograde had become like such a thing like specifically that but I think that that's almost like with that moment has passed <laughs> so yeah um yeah like that was just like that that one was hard because it's like I do have strong feelings about that or not strong, I have feelings about that but it's just like I don't know if that makes like a good episode you know I just don't know who wants to listen to that either you agree with me and you maybe you want to listen to me because you agree with me or you don't and you definitely don't um want to listen to me so <laughs> I would like your strong opinion on this final round of rapid fire questions. <laughs> which, see if I can do it. Let's see um, if I can bring it. W they're taken from your episodes and not difficult, but <laughs> I'm going to ask you too, Kev. So get ready. Red or blue M&Ms? Willa? Blue. Kevin? Red. Willa, Bart or Lisa? Lisa. Lisa. Ronald McDonald or Bozo? 
who's Bozo? Bozo the Clown? Bozo the Clown is like, I've talked about him. He was like the one on the TV before. I feel like I barely know Bozo because it's like, <laughs> so Ronald McDonald. Okay. Bozo. Fine art or Ikea art? Fine art. Let's be a snob about it. <laughs> Ikea and art. Let's just lower the tone a bit. <laughs> Uh, so laugh track on friends or no laugh track? Ooh, that's hard. That's hard. I think they both have their place. That's not a strong opinion. <laughs> I think, I think it needs a laugh track. <laughs> Super 8 or Hilton? Oh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, are you passing on this one? <laughs> Given I write about these people for my day <laughs> job. Um, uh, Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, we're moving on to haircuts. Business or party? Oh, party. <laughs> party in the back? Yeah, party. party. I, I, I tell you, Willa, that, that line at the beginning of that episode about mullets, when it says, you know, the mullet, the one that's business at the front and party at the back. Every time I hear that or recite that line in my head, I giggle. So thank you very much. If For sure, you know, more. that's like what we call it here. That's not like. No, I didn't. Which is probably <laughs> why I'm still laughing now whenever I hear it. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's like the most. I mean, actually, I really tried to find the person who created that phrase because that is. <laughs> That's the most famous, you know, business in the front part of the act. We had a lead, but it's like definitely from some message board in the nineties. Uh, I really, we, we, we tried a little bit, like it didn't, it seemed like it was going to be, we didn't need it enough and it was going to be a bunch of work, but I really wanted to find that person. Cause I thought that was, I mean, that person. Well, really it's, it. it was new to me. So <laughs> thank you anyway. Yeah. All right. La last one, Obama or the boss. Oh, Obama. <laughs> Is that, did you take this from my writing? That's not from, that's not from an episode. Um, you know, they're both good at different things. I just don't want to listen to Renegade. <laughs> but I Obama's would be happy. Obama's but probably a better president than the boss would be. And the yeah, boss no, I would take them for what they are. I would take Obama. And then I've, I've actually like Dancing in the Dark, the Bruce Springsteen song has been like my seed song for the last like six months. Like when I'm cooking, I put it okay. in Spotify and then that's like the song. So I'm, I'm feeling very fond of the boss right now. But yeah, um, no, Obama maybe. Okay. <laughs> But that was a lot of like not strong opinions. Those things are all like, they're like, that's both two good things. Two good things. All right. Well, thank you very much, Willa, for joining us on Metapod. It was a pleasure and a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry if I interrupted you all many times <laughs> while you were asking the questions. I felt like I just started talking. But no problem. We do that happened. to each other all the time. As Kevin does it all the time. <laughs> Thank you to Willa Paskin of Decoder Ring, which returns to the airwaves in June with a bunch of new cultural phenomena to unravel. Yeah, we'll put some links to our favorite episodes of Decoder Ring in the show notes that accompanies this episode on metapodshow.com. Now, down to business matters, Kev. Next week is our 20th episode. And my goodness, I can't believe we've made it. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and we've got a terrific podcast and an utterly delightful host to share with you. It'll be none other than Dallas Taylor of 20,000 Hertz. Now, Wendy, tell our listeners what 20,000 Hertz is and what they can expect from our episode. Yeah, so to borrow the tagline of 20,000 Hertz, it's the stories behind the world's most recognizable and interesting sounds. Dallas is super smart, a wonderful host, and clearly knows heaps about the world of sound design. Seriously, I absolutely love this podcast. So perhaps one of my favorites, actually, Wendy, of the uh, mm. cultural, factual genre that we've featured so far. If you want to learn about the origins of the Netflix chimes, for example, the science behind the noises that dinosaurs make in the movies, the history of the Watergate tapes, or the influences of the 808 drum machine, to just name a few, then this really is the podcast for you. We're very excited about this episode, and not just because we've made it to 20 episodes. Coming up in our 20s, we also have a trio of brilliant shows to bring you. My Fugitive, Stay Away from Matthew McGill, and the fascinating and sometimes unsettling Apology Line. Those are all coming soon. So there you go. Worth pointing out also, from June till August, we're going to go fortnightly on Metapod. As the summer kicks in and we and our guests try to recharge a bit from, well, you know, pretty much everything over the last year or so. Yes, but the show goes on, so meet us back here next time. And uh, I guess we're done for this episode, Mr. May. Farewell from us. Thanks again to this week's guest, Willa Paskin. And we'll see you next time.
that's it for Metapod this time. Thanks for listening. Metapod will be back soon with another unpacking of the web's most interesting podcasts. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. We'd hate for you to miss upcoming episodes, and we'd love it if you left us a review. You can let us know what you think of this episode by going to metapodshow.com. We'll see you next time. Metapod is produced by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May.